All right, good morning, everyone. It is just 10 o'clock by my count, so thank you all for joining us um, on this lovely morning, hopefully for most people, or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Amber Eby, and if you've joined us before, you know I'm a grant specialist for Maddie's Fund, and that, as always, I'm super excited to be hosting today's huddle, um, which is our second to last huddle for the No Place Like Home Challenge. Um, today, just like our other huddles, we're going to have 20 minutes of presentation time, followed by time for live Q&A. So just like most of the Zoom calls you've been on for the past year, um, you are all muted. We are going to um, keep everyone muted for the presentations. And then once the presentation is over, um, we'll have time for questions. You are welcome to type your question in the chat or you can raise your hand with the uh, raise your hand icon. We call on you unmute you and then you can ask your question. Um, but again, we'll be doing that at the end of the presentation so we can give the speakers time to share their great information. Uh, we are recording this session and the session will be posted within 24 hours to the No Place Like Home Challenge group on Maddie's Pet Forum and our website. So please feel free to view it again or share it with your friends and coworkers. So now I'm super excited to introduce our moderator and our speakers today. Our moderator for all the huddles and um, my co-host has been Gina Knapp, the National Shelter Engagement Director at Michelson Found Animals. And Michelson is also a partner of this challenge as well. Um, so today Gina is going to moderate the talk with Chris Fitzgerald from the city of Rochester and Adam Ricci from NACA. Um, Gina has been into RTO since way before before it was cool. We are so excited to have her joining us for this challenge. So please take it away, Gina. Thanks, Amber. I'm jazzed to have the dynamic duo with us today, Christopher and Adam. Um, the topic of legislation and code when I managed the Front Street Animal Shelter was probably the most difficult thing for me, changing the laws and all the rigmarole and the hoops. And it, it was it was the hardest part of my job. So I hope that Chris and Adam can touch on that. I won't yak any longer, but take it away, gentlemen. Hi, I'm Chris Fitzgerald in Rochester. I think Adam's going to be joining us momentarily. We're gonna we're gonna do it a little bit differently, if if possible. We're gonna try and uh, just tag team through the the whole thing instead of doing my part and then Adam's part. So I'll I'll jump in. I'm. Um, I'm the director of animal services here in, in Rochester. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. How'd that work? So, um, and Adam's gonna, I'll let Adam introduce himself when he comes on. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also jazzed. Uh, I don't know if I'd call us the dy dynamic duo or the odd couple, but you know, whatever the, the duo you, Whatever the pair you uh, you want to run with, um, you know I think the, these huddles are great. I, I I view them as shared learning opportunities, and and you know Gina can tell you every call that we've been on. Um, you know if I if I share something, I probably learn at least two or three other things for everything I share. So I'm I'm excited to share what's uh, what's going on with uh, laws and and how we've worked within them or around them um, in, in Rochester, um, but also then to open up and, and hear from you folks and what's working with, um, with you and your communities. So real quick, Chris, I just wanna say I, I am here. I had some technical difficulties getting signed on. Thank you, Brittany, for getting me squared away. Um, I'm assuming you've already done your introduction there, Chris. Yeah, go for it though. All right, okay. Um, so I'm Adam Rickey um, with the National Animal Care and Control Association. I'm currently the secretary. I've uh, been on the board for I mean, a number of years now. Uh, my background, I worked in various states, different departments um, under different types of laws and regulations. And, and that's the background that I'm going to be bringing to this conversation today. All right, uh, you know, I think it helps to frame a little bit about the organization. So Rochester is a mid-sized city, just over 200,000 people. We're a municipal animal services organization. You know, it was historically uh, open admission, but we're, we're definitely more managed admission now. Um, historically, like 6,000 plus intakes and 
you know, 3,500 is like an average um, pre-COVID uh, and pre-Haas. So, so now, you know, I'm hoping that 2,000 is like as high as we go, but we'll see, see how things shake out. Um, the, that's our area that we serve, the jurisdiction just of the city of Rochester. Um, we are, uh, there's the calls for service there. You know, we're a Pets for Life mentorship uh, partner organization, and we're one of the Haas pilot organizations. In terms of our field services uh, strength in numbers, we, uh, we historically had nine animal control officers and three supervisors over 24 hours. And we've whittled that down uh, some um, um, by budget cuts. Um, we've we've um, been victimized of, of budget cuts, but um, so now there's five animal control officers, there's two supervisors and two part-time positions. And those are split between, not evenly, but they're a combination of animal control um, and uh, more like community outreach support specialists. So just a list of some of the, the common uh, laws and ordinances that we see um, in, in our community and, and some of these may be in, in yours. And I'm, I'm, I'd love it if people have other ordinance they wanna talk about later. But you know, the meat and potatoes of animal control has always been things like you know, at-large dogs and dangerous dogs and dog licensing. So, so those are some of the things that we have on this list that, and then we'll touch on, on each one and how how it either interferes with or can be worked around or adjusted or amended to support um, returning pets to their owners. Very good, Chris. And you know, one of the biggest conversations that you need to have when you're thinking about ordinances um, and state laws is really looking at the type of wording that you're using um, from coming from multiple organizations in different states. I have never worked um, in an organization where I could say the at large or um, the confinement laws are identical from one community to the next. Um, also working in a, like a large county like Pima, um, Pima County, when I was with the Pima Animal Care Center, we had multiple communities that we provided um, responses for and not a single one of them shared any level of ordinance from one community to the next. And that's something to be very mindful of when you start looking at your laws and ordinances, what are the wording what, what, what are you trying to accomplish with it and making sure that you're able to do what you need to be able to do in and around those laws. So taking a look at um, at <clears throat> at large dogs or, or leash laws, you know, the, the the wording usually is is, you know, something along the lines of an animal shall shall not be allowed to run at large, you know, uh, in a community uh, and, and then it gets into specifics if there's if there's, you know, if it's on a, a restraint, but that restraint allows it to go into a, the public area or common areas. Um, so um, so on our end, you know, when we look at that, we, we look at, okay, this is like the, the letter of the law, but in terms of us trying to return this little white and brown dog to its owner, you know, we want to work with that. We, you know, what, it, what does it serve us to have that dog taken, put in a van and brought back to the shelter? So while the law may say um, that the, you know, the ACO shall seize and impound the animal, you know, we want to challenge what that that definition is. Um, you know, is is it does it have to be a seizure? Is it is it um, does can it be a temporary confinement or detainment um, to assist with reunification? And so, you know, all these bullets are related to the the things you've probably been hearing throughout the huddles and and before throughout the the challenge and and before with respect to how do we support return to home and, and a lot of that can happen with your frontline um, animal control personnel, animal services officers, animal protection officers, whatever you call it. Um, <clears throat> if they can spend uh, a bit of time in the neighborhoods, um, you know, what, what has been found uh, not just in Rochester but, but elsewhere is that uh, most of the animals uh, that we pick up, most of the dogs anyways that we pick up are within a few blocks of their homes. And so spending some time on the front end can, can really pay off. Um, and then, you know, some of the specifics of how you do that and whether or not you have to issue a ticket or, um, or you know, a warning, or if there's, if there's some required documentation, you know, may vary 
from place to place. And I, th I think it's, you know, it's worth, again, looking at, like Adam said, you know, how are things worded and how are they similar or dissimilar to, to you know, what we're talking about? But is there room to, to work within those laws to, uh, you know, affect the change that we're, that we're shooting for? Yeah. And one of the biggest things that you're going to see in the legal language and around laws and regulations is the word shall. Um, shall does not leave you a single bit of wiggle room. It basically says shall whatever comes after that is what you must do. And then you get into the definitions like um, Christopher was bringing up was the shall seize. OK, well, now what's the definition of seize? Like, what does that actually mean? Um, so when you're looking at your laws and your regulations, you're going to want to, especially with the changes in programming in the way field officers can go out and help do the reunification with pets and help get them back to their homes, that you're going to be looking for more generalized language where you're going to be trying to replace shall for may. Um, that's going to open up those opportunities immensely um, for officers to use the discretion to figure out what's the best, you know, next step for that pet um, and what do they have available to them to help with getting that pet back to the home. And then, you know, considering what uh, what's within your control, are you able to uh, work with your local uh, municipal or county attorneys to change local ordinances to give you that uh, that discretion or that flexibility with the how things are worded, um, or does it have to happen at the state level? And if if you have a state federation or some other advocacy that that can help with. Um, um, you know, work towards changing legislation to support what's what's best for the communities and and our indus industry. In terms of um, dangerous dog, you know, most most communities have some sort of uh, local and state law uh, re regarding the the you know the how how dogs are kept. Um, you, know, you know, when they when they are either known to bite or after they've they've bitten they have there's a process that's laid out in terms of taking the uh, owner to court and having the the dog deemed dangerous um adam did you want to jump in here or do you want me to just keep rolling with my rochester experience oh no you can go right ahead with your rochester experience um maybe the biggest thing when you're going to be looking at dangerous dogs and i mean the laws is i mean there's so many of the processes are based off of the rabies compendium and the rabies compendium is basically recommendations um, as to, you mean, how to really go forward. So if you don't actually follow the rabies compendium guidelines, then you're not actually violating anything like from the federal side of things. And so everything is really mandated at the state and local levels um, for all of those processes. So, so we've worked at the local level then, you know, when there's a, a bite that involves a uh, contact that breaks the skin, uh, we work with closely with the, the public health department on, um, you know, getting some flexibility or discretion in terms of whether or not the, the dog needs to be uh, seized and, and um, impounded for the confinement and observation period of 10 days, or if, or if we can allow the owner to keep the dog confined. And, and our preference uh, is almost always for the home confinement for the for the for the dog's well being, but but also, you know, it's safer for, for everyone. When we do have uh, dogs that come in on some sort of a, a bite, and there's a, a pending court case, they often get held for a very long time. And so to, to place an animal that, you know, may or may not have had some aggression, um, uh, you know, propensities, uh, but into, you know, almost like solitary confinement in a stressful environment for weeks, if not months, um, and then potentially release that dog after the court proceeding, if, if that's how the ruling lands, uh, you know, it seems like it's, you're worse off, your community is worse off, the dog is certainly worse off than, than when you started. So we really try and be selective about when we um, seize an animal with where we have uh, really credible um, uh, evidence, uh, you know, testimony um, uh, that that we have made essentially a determination about what's best before we go ahead and seize the animal. Because if at all possible, we'd rather the the animals stay with the owner. And then if there's other types of, you know, fallout enforcement, um, you know, we, we could issue citations instead. Um, and, you know, we actually have 
a dangerous dog citation at the local level. So it's like a lesser penalty than taking it to um, uh, the court proceeding where a judge might have the opportunity to um, rule the, the destruction of the dog. Uh, I, <clears throat> we have this ordinance in uh, in our in our local laws um, that you know a female dog must be that's in heat must be confined to the owner's premises. So I, I don't know. Tom, I mean, Tom Shannon, he's our supervisor of animal control. He's on this call too. Janelle Lang is the shelter manager. She's on the call too. This is a team effort, and I'm glad that they're here with me. But um, you know, Tom might know if we've if we've ever. Um, you know, issued or, or seized a dog on on this specifically, but um, but if you find the dog at large, uh, you've already got the at large um, ordinance that you'd be working with, and you know we're we're, um, we're bringing we're bringing as roughly as many, if not more than um, as uh, as many dogs to their homes directly as we're returning from the shelter right now. So. Um, so if we were to encounter uh, a female dog in heat, um, you know, the ordinance in, in Rochester doesn't say it, it, the dog has to be seized now and taken away. It just says that the dog has to be confined to the owner's premises. So, um, so that would allow us to still bring the dog back and make sure that it's confined on the owner's premises and then talk, talk with the owner about, um, you know, why that's important. Yeah, and sometimes you'll get into certain communities. Uh, City of Albuquerque had this. Um, and so what we basically had was a mandate from the city, like anything that we um, release back um, had to, in order to have a unspayed or neutered pet, you had to have a specialty license in order to have that within the city of Albuquerque. And if you were found with an unspayed or neutered pet, and then you wanted to get it returned back to you, you'd actually have to go through an appeal process that the city put in, which created a lot of hurdles and everything else. Um, the ultimate goal was, you mean, to really push the spay or neuter initiative. And so that was the basis behind it. And I cannot think of a single time that the individual who overheard the appeals ever approved a license after it was picked up um, you know, by, by animal control, but also at the same time, we provide all the spay and neuter surgeries for free. So that way it was actually at no expense to them. The city actually covered the costs um, you mean to be able to do that. These types of laws that you mean to get a little tricky, um, how you implement them, are there appeals processes, you know, what, what, what's the word that really went into it. Um, where in Albuquerque, we didn't really have a lot of wiggle room um, with it. Uh, the person who handled the appeals was a stickler um, for, for the process that they were in charge with. Um, so it was something that we were always kind of um, battling with and trying to find other little ways to handle and address and get these pets back to their owners um, in, in a way that, you know, met the, the needs of the city. Uh, most of us have some sort of licensing requirement, either locally or at the state level. Um, so, you know, there's, there's definitely a movement to, to either, either uh, move away from licensing or to combine licensing or replace licensing with microchipping. So just looking at the numbers in Rochester, this is, uh, these are ballpark numbers because, you know, we're working on an estimate of, of what we think the dog population would be. Um, but we're, we're probably under 10% every year that, that I've been here. And, um, in terms of compliance and, and you know but that's like uh you know some people might say well you need to work on enforcement but but you know to to what end the the licensing program as it stands doesn't doesn't pay for itself it's it's cost pro prohibitive for the city really but um but there's there's so many other things that support returning the dog to the owner in terms of uh identification tags microchip um and then various new technologies so you know, I, I'm not saying scrap dog licensing, but um, but I am supportive of it, you know, it being one of several things that that may assist with returning dogs to homes. Um, Adam, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I'm one of the I, I'm very proud to say I'm probably one of the, the few people in the profession that has actually um, got rid of dog license in the community that I work. We did it in Albuquerque. Um, we ended up, you know, like most you mean communities are going to look at it and say, where's the money going? And like, what is it doing for us? Um, we were losing $27,000 a year for the city. 
and it just wasn't working. But we also had um, a couple of things working for us. One, the state um, um, statute actually said we may have a licensing program. So that was like the first big victory. Like we weren't required to do it within the state. So once we had that window um, identified, um, we jumped right in and started looking at it. The city also already had a mandatory microchip law. So we didn't have to change anything by adapting over to the microchip. It was basically taking the license away and the way we, we sold it to the city council and the mayor and everything else, the license was a regulatory tax to regulate already regulated functions such as rabies vaccinations and microchips. So it was really an, an addition to that wasn't really needed anymore because enough of the other programs and processes were already put in place to be able to track, you mean, what information on the dogs, um, who owner information was because of the microchip. And we we're also able to implement that program in a way that, again, very co um, cost effective to the community members, free. All you had to do was register your microchip with the, the city shelter and you were within compliance of the law. So as long as you got your microchip, there was no cost to you um, at any point from the time of where you got the microchip um, registered going forward. So it was basically a lifetime registration for free underneath the microchip. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. I think we're running behind the, the um, so fees and fines, you know, if you have the ability to, to waive them, I, you know, that might be something that you already have discretion. If it's actually written into your code, it may involve some changes to code or possibly um, uh, revision of uh, administrative policies. But, um, but if, you can, if you can either offer donation-based structure, waive fees, or have you know, some sort of a payment plan, um, that certainly removes these additional barriers for being able to release uh, animals to their owners, whether it's in the field or from the facility. Um, I'm gonna go on unless you wanna chime in, Adam. That's another one where may charge fee, um, key, key wording. Uh, this is just showing the trend here in Rochester over like a 20 year period that we shifted from um, from a heavy focus on issuing citations to to issuing written warnings. And then a few years back, we um, changed our notice of warning to be dually purposed and it could also just be informational. So we use the same form and just check a box if, if it's info related. And so the info and warning uh, combination um, significantly outnumbers the citations because we are supporting our, our officers and having that, that discretion in the field and whether or not um, they issue uh, a punitive measure or provide some sort of support. Uh, mandatory sterilization, another ordinance that we had in place here for about 10 years, um, and it was not um, not community wide, but in terms of pre release. So if someone was trying to reclaim a dog that came in um, picked up at large, it had to be sterilized first and um, You know, this was contentious for sure and but it did create an unnecessary barrier to um, returning pets to owners. So while we may have um, supported, you know, a few hundred, um, um, you know, kind of forced uh, or under duress um, uh, sterilizations during those years, um, we, by the time we repealed it, we were doing so much proactive uh, community focused spay and neuter that, you know, not putting this barrier up didn't mean that there were fewer surgeries happening in the community. And, supporting the, the return of that animal to the owner and having the conversation with them more in a, in a cordial way about how they've got their dog back and that they, we offer these services, um, I think is the, the right approach. Jump around on the next one, Chris. Um, in Rochester, we have a, a limit on the number of dogs that someone can have um, in their, um, in their, on their premises and that it varies uh, between, it, it's up to four dogs if it's in a uh, single family household and actually up to like a, um, an apartment that has three units. But once you get to four or more units, now the limit drops to one. So, you know, the way I look at this, and this is still on the books, but one that I'm, I'm hoping to, um, to change is that 
you know, if you've got other ordinances on the books that have to do with, um, you know, barking complaints or um, nuisances like like um, the accumulation of feces, then you're kind of already addressing those things. And if an owner in an apartment building that you know has has two dogs and is keeping up with the you know the the picking up after their pets and their dogs aren't creating barking nuisances, it seems like um, an uh, you know an unnecessary regulation. Um, so it's something that I'm working on challenging. Yeah, and one, one thing to always keep in mind for those with field officers or people that are responding to them, if a apartment complex puts in policies on limits, it's not your job to enforce. That's a good point. Um, in terms of abuse and neglect, you know, in New York State, we actually don't have authority as civilian employees uh, um, of our city to enforce or investigate animal abuse and neglect, and yet we're, we're actually frequently asked to go and even uh, expected to go and, uh, you know, provide some level of uh, triage. So we often go under what's called check the welfare calls, um, even though we don't really have that, that authority. Um, and, you know, the way we look at it is, again, it's kind of triage, but if it, um, if it enables us to approach the thing from a, you know, with a non-judgmental supportive um, approach, as opposed to uh, criminalizing everything that, that we come in contact. And, and a lot of these issues are related to access to resources. So instead of um, a police officer um, or even a, a peace officer going, um, you know, from the humane organization, um, they, they may be looking at, at just like the condition of the animal um, and, and not necessarily all of the, the circumstances that may be, you know, part of the part of the systemic, um, uh, you know, barriers in, in access to resources. So, um, so we do go on these calls, we do try to write, try and provide support, but we make referrals if we see things that seem like it's actual egregious or intentional neglect or abuse. And this is going to be one of the biggest areas where you're going to see a split in field services personnel um, is do they have this authority or not? It's very important, you know, as Chris has gone over and others in the state will probably be able to tell you for like New York um, in areas that I work, whether it's state of Maine, Arizona, New Mexico, um, I have never not been the person to be part of the investigations or have the officers working um, with me not be part of that investigation. So you mean this is where there is a big split and it's really based more off of law. Um, then really the desire and capability um, to be able to do it. I can guarantee you Chris and his team are more than capable of doing the work that is being done. They just are not given that legal authority to be able to do so. And that is not the same community to community, state to state. And then tethering and chaining, you know, we don't have an ordinance uh, um, that speaks to this in, in Rochester. It's been something that we've considered over the years, but my my position, on, our position on it is is similar to our, our position on abuse and neglect in that, um, that oftentimes, you know, pe people that are keeping their animal out on a chain or a tether aren't doing so because they don't care about that animal. They're doing so because either they, that like, that's the, that's the options that they have. There's some sort of uh, issue related to access to information or resources. And, you know, we may be able to support them keeping their pet in some way. And maybe that means getting it on a runner that's safer for the, for the dog. It's not gonna get tangled and gives it more freedom of movement, um, but, but it still it needs to be kept outside for whatever reason. Jump on the next one, Chris. So I just have a few uh, slides with stats that we don't we don't have to go into right now because I know we're we're well into our our time. So I'll defer to Gina if she wants to um, look at any of the the stats or or open it up for questions. Chris, I think the most telling thing on that uh, spreadsheet is look at the amazing increase of return in field starting at 19.8 and ending up at 35%. That's, that's astonishing. Um, all of your numbers are going in the right direction. And gosh, if everybody in the country could do that, heck, we would be out of business maybe. Chris, there was a question. I have so many thoughts. I even took notes, but there was a question for you, Chris. Um, I, 
as you know, in New York shelters, I guess you get inspected every year. And the, the person submitting the question says that they have failed an entire inspection because they don't have license copies attached to DL-18. I'm not sure what, they, what that is, DL-18 forms. Yes. Or they don't charge at least the $10 re redemption fee. How, how can they get around that? Yeah, so, well, this is being recorded. Um, I'll talk <laughs> to you offline. Um, so, so, you know, my experience though is, is that, you know, inspector to inspector, things, things vary. Um, so, you know, it, it, you know, jokes aside, maybe we should connect offline, but, um, but, you know, failing inspections from the state, you know, uh, um, you know, I, my pushback on, on any kind of notice or, um, you know, comment that we've gotten on any of our inspections has been to, to, to provide pushback supported by documentation. You know, what is the industry best practice on it? What is, you know, what's happening right now? And, you know, who can support what you're doing, um, whether it's, you know, waiving fees, waiving fines, you know, getting that, those content experts and those resources to back your position. And if you work for, you know, if you work for a municipality or a county, you know, you, you should probably talk to your, your um, legal office and, and let them know, here's what's going on in our industry. And, and, you know, the inspectors are still operating, you know, as they have been for, for decades. So, you know, you can actually help inform change in, in that process. And that, that would be my, my hope. It, if you have a federation that works on um, state legislation though, that's another avenue for you is to, you know, to, to take these, these points to the federation, join the federation, become a board member of the federation um, and get involved actively in, in advocating for legislative change that, that is most important for our industry in your state. Chris, I, there's a question, but it kind of ties to a question that I had. You had the slide up that showed the citations. It was a lot of green citations all the way, and then it moved all the way down to a little bit of blue. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So do we, do we have any idea what the cost of issuing all those citations was in comparison to actual revenue collected? And that ties into the question of how the heck do you have the money to have an in-house vet, not charge fees, no money from licensing, et cetera. Where's the money coming from to run your programs? And do you have any idea what it costs you to write all those tickets? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, no, I'm not off the top of my head, but I know that the, in, in New York state licensing is, um, it's enforced by, it's, uh, um, it's a state requirement, but it's administered by each municipality through the clerk's office. So in addition to my personnel that are involved with it, and I do have cost um, detail on this, I just don't have those files open. But so in addition to whatever calculation we've, we've figured out for what it costs in terms of our part of licensing, there's also the city clerk's office that has you know, a portion of their clerical um, positions are doing dog license issuance every day. And then there's the, the hearing office that hears the citations and administers the, the hearing program. So, you know, the, the short answer is, is that there's absolutely no, no um, revenue generation here. It, it, you know, the, the um, roughly $40,000 a year that comes in in terms of license revenue and maybe twelve dollars to $15,000 in citation payments you know, it has paid for maybe a position. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's absolutely not, but so then the second part of the question is a little bit harder, right? Well, how, how do you afford, I mean, you don't, you don't afford these things by, by generating revenue. You, again, you afford these things by making the case for that there's value to the services we're providing to the community and, and changing the, flipping the whole conversation around not to how are we going to afford to do these things, but how can our community afford not to do them? That, I mean, this is, these are services that are important for the communities, just as uh, uh, other forms of, um, you know, public assistance and uh, food assistance. And, and so, you know, it's it's reframing the the conversation around the value of 
uh, a non-revenue generating service. Well, th for those of us that are in government, um, we're public servants and we have a responsibility for, um, oh gosh, just to be fiscal stewards. And what you're currently doing in the layout of the, the far right of the graph is far more appropriate use of tax money than what you had done previously. Um, I totally agree with you 100%. There's no, uh, there's no way. It's not, it's not a cost recovery. It's not even a cost neutral venture. Um, one of the things, maybe Adam, uh, you want to touch on this, that whole word discretion. You know, if I get pulled over for speeding, the police officer can give me a ticket or not, right? Give me a warning. And if I commit a murder, they're obviously going to take me to jail. We, we have this discretion in the law. There's the shells and the maze. But one of the most challenging things I experienced uh, as I tried to transform the culture of animal control in Sacramento was shifting the mindset of the officers. Because people tend to like black and white because it's so much easier. But can you talk a little bit about how, how do you encourage your officers to be free thinkers, right? Sure, absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. Um, for those who don't, don't know my background, I used to be a police officer as well. Um, so I was that person making that decision on whether you got a ticket or not. Um, and I can even start the conversation from there. Um, there was one year for the police department I worked for, I led in traffic stops. Um, I had over 800 traffic stops over the course of the year. I wrote four citations, <laughs> right? And you mean, what's the goal? You mean, and that's where the conversation comes into it, whether it's the police side or the animal side, what's the goal? And you really got to start the conversation around that culture. So if the culture is to create, you mean a safe community where pets, um, where people can enjoy the community and pets are safe and people are safe in these neighborhoods, what is it that you have to do to accomplish that goal? If you start building your culture around that conversation, that's how you're going to get the free thinkers um, you mean involved. You're going to have your first early adopters really quickly within your officers that are going to get it. Like, oh, this makes so much sense. We're on it. Like, you got it. You got your middle of the road people who are just kind of like, let's see how this goes. And then you got the people that are not going to be you mean on top of it or you, you mean not, not involved to the level in which you want. And that's where there's a certain level of accountability from a leadership role that you really have to take into consideration. And the way that I always did it was being noticeable in the hallways in and around where the officers were bringing dogs into the shelter. And I will pick on one of my favorite officers ever. It was one of the best conversations. He showed up one day, had two dogs. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, brought two dogs in. I'm like, why? Explain to me why. That's a simple question. And he started in the story, the owner was arrested. I'm like, okay, where were they? Well, they're at their house. Anybody else live in the house? Well, his mother. Well, where was she? Well, she was at work. What time did she get out of work? Well, I don't know. Well, it's 2.30 right now. What's the chance that she's home by 5, 30, 6 o'clock tonight? And, you know, the whole concept was getting him to understand that why did you bring these dogs in? Like there was no reason for you, you know, to have to do that. And it was always engaging it in a conversation to allow them to start to put the pieces together based off the questions that I would ask them. So that way they would start to understand the way we should really start looking at the problem, right? We shouldn't just go, PD called us, we've got to pick up the dogs. We need to go and have, you know, a little bit more thought about the, in the entirety of, you mean, what's going on and whether it's a stray dog or everything else, like, is that dog a threat? Y you know, where does that fit into your priority response? Um, in Albuquerque, we deprioritize stray, healthy, happy dogs. You know, we would get com complaints about a dog running at large and the reporting party would say, having the best time of its life. That is not the dog you need to go and pick up. But they're like, that dog is fine. He's got to make his way back home. He's probably two houses away from where he lives. And so, you mean, going and redoing that prioritization also helped change that culture to really put an emphasis on dog bites, um, high level animal cruelty and building that entire priority system, not necessarily off the type of calls, but risk factors. So if there was an immediate risk to a human being, priority one. Now that could be a, a variety of different type of call types. And then priority two, immediate risk to an animal. So we've already set the priority for the public safety component over animals, people over animals, but we they're very close to each other in the way we're able to respond with our staffing levels. And building your entire system around a model like that helps change that culture as well, because the person who wants to go and pick up all the dogs can't, because he's never gonna get to that call today, because he's gonna be busy or she's gonna be busy with so many more important calls that they either get on board and focus on, you mean those works that are being able to get done, that you mean those others just, they don't, they don't make it. And that's not a bad thing. 
Thank you. Certainly. And we have to remember that we're all not, Amber, how are we doing for time? We're doing great, Gina. We've got about 10 minutes, so. Okay, good. So Still time for good questions. There's been a little bit of, of, of chatter in the, well, chatter, chat in the chat box about whether licensing programs pay for themselves or not. So in some organizations, your licensing revenue, adoption revenue, all goes back to the general fund and you're given you know, one budget to stay with in, in annually. When I was in Sacramento, we everything that we collected and everything we raised stayed within our organization and it did not go back to the general fund. So there was a lot of incentive to raise money. Annette said that her uh, patent with Stannis Law, that her licensing program paid for itself. Ours did in Sacramento as well, because we moved to an automatic citation for failure to license. So after the third notice, they got a $300 ticket because in our code, it allowed for, it's an admin penalty. Uh, they were gonna go to jail for not paying it, but they would get turned over to collections. And we found that that $300 a ticket inspired people to get into compliance, either you know, get a license or get their animal spayed or neutered, which we offered to do at no cost to get that, that animal properly licensed. So we're, we're all different. And, and, you know, we, it's impossible to compare a, a fruit basket to an orchard, but working within whatever structure we do have. And then, I don't know, I think it's really important to question what makes sense, you know, and if we're going to do like mandatory spay and neuter in a jurisdiction, do we have the services to provide people? If we're going to, you know, issue a citation for $300 to everybody that doesn't license their pet, what are the ramifications of that? And given the, the climate of this country right now with unemployment, housing crisis, uh, most municipals don't want to punish people. So if you wanna make changes to your code to make life easier, now would be a great time to do that. Did, did I miss anything in the chat, Amber? So um, there's a good question. Does anyone have data? Uh, and we talked about this a little bit, right? Like the data um, of fees versus fines and revenue versus cost of uh, caring for the animals. Um, so if there's someone who does have that or has a great like, you know, research on that data on that, if we could share it in the forum or if anyone wants to drop anything in the chat, that would be very helpful. Um, but this that would also be a good question for Maddie's Pet Forum. Um, but Gina, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Well, I don't know that anybody, I haven't seen a study yet that really analyzes the, the cost of doing business versus what's collected. Um, we, did a, we did a big audit in Sacramento before I left, and I can't remember if that's a component of it, but I'll look for it and if there's some reference to that. Uh, but most of the time, our programs don't, the revenue we generate does not, um, cover the cost of doing business. And you have to think about the total cost, labor, paper, you know, keeping the lights on, all of that. And then there's the whole community relationship, right? How do we wanna be perceived by our community? What is our purpose? Um, and that's clearly shifting uh, who we are and what we do and how we do it. Definitely. Um, and then there is a question too from Lori that just came in that says, will there be state specific sessions for laws and legislation in the future? Mm. That's a tough one to do with. With how varied everything is. Right. Yeah. And I know in California, we have cow animals, right? So we have a mm organization that's dedicated to California specific calls and like in Florida, they have, you know, FACA. Right. Um, so I, I'm sure there are some state levels that might have better specific resources for the state specifically. Tracy from Chico makes a very good point. I was thinking this earlier, if we have fewer animals coming into our facilities, that's going to help us reduce cost, right? It, it, things should get exponentially better than, than what they used to be. Chris, do you have anything else to add? You know, I, I just have to say this. Chris and I have probably been on a hundred calls together in the last six, eight months. We've never met, but I just feel like I know you, Chris. I can't wait to see you in person. I know, you guys so feel many, that way about your Zoom buddies? So many virtual hugs and not a single <laughs> in-person one. Um, but but yeah, look out when we meet. Um, yeah, no, I think that was a great point though about those, those cost savings too, because then you can reallocate some resources to 
know, someone else was saying, well, how do you how do you justify supporting a full time veterinarian and other things? You know that I mean that's part of it. If you're right, if you're reducing your overhead costs on a per animal basis, um, you can it free up trees up resources. So you know to, to help in other areas. And then someone else put in the chat something about relying on donations and uh, friends groups. I think to to help with supporting you know and augmenting anything that's beyond the scope. So those are all those are all you know avenues to pursue too as as you, especially if you're, if you're seeing reductions or you're causing reductions in revenue and you're, the powers that be are expecting revenue numbers to, to um, climb, finding external sources of revenue can be helpful mm -hmm. even as a, a, a government entity. No, I don't think we have any other questions. Good points on the 501c3s, though they're a uh, godsend. Deanne was raising her hand. Deanne, do you have a question? Deanne Schaefer? No? I can't, we can't hear you, Deanne. Can you yeah, type Deanne, in? Oh, Deanne, will you go ahead and unmute yourself? It looks like you're still muted. Okay, try it now. No. Can you type it in the chat? Thanks, Deanne. Deanne's just down Interstate 90 from us in Syracuse. I also haven't met Deanne outside of a virtual space. Have Chris, have you and Adam met in person? Uh, no, I don't think no. so. <laughs> no, I mean we we may have crossed paths somewhere, but like it's hard to even remember in person conferences. <laughs> it's hard to remember the last time you met someone new, right? Like in real <laughs> life. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks, Deanne. So Deanne says, so we border city of Syracuse and they don't participate in anything like this. How do I open up the conversation? E easy. The, yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, pick up the phone or get them on a Zoom meeting right now. Like normally I would say drive to them, um, but that's not really something we can really promote still at this time. Um, but you just really gotta start, like, start having the conversation. And, and I think this also goes back to like, if you're in a government entity, how do you push some of these initiatives? And the biggest thing you have to be able to do, you have to have your ear to the ground as to what's important to the elected officials and the folks that are working, you know, on the high end for the community. Um, you know, I'll bring it back to the Albuquerque pet licensing. When we got rid of that, the mayor had an initiative to, to do away with out of state contracts. Well, we were contracting our licensing to an out of state contractor. So we actually attached it to a bigger initiative that was going on in Muncie City. And we did that with all of our elected officials, all the counselors and everyone that was elected. We would meet with them regularly and just get an idea of what, what was going on for their constituents. And every time we saw an opportunity, we would attach a program to it. Like, well, if we could do this, if we could do this, well, we could take money from here and shift it and not do this anymore and do this over here. And it, it was very easy sell one right after the other. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you got to be willing to go have those conversations with those folks. But when you go there, it, it's listening to like what they're currently um, seeing and feeling as well, right? Not really just to push your agenda. You go in to listen first, figure out where you have those opportunities. And then that's where you go in and start, you, you know, making your changes. Also, like, inviting them to, you know, to, you know, webinars and, sharing learning um, is helpful too, so that it's not necessarily just Deanne Schaefer's um, message that you're trying to, to convince them on, you know, it's more about, you know, like having a conversation that, that you've already engaged in and bringing those other parties into the conversation. Yeah, and one other thing to think about, like an easy way for people to adapt to change is like the three I's, introduce, isolate, integrate. So like having that conversation up front, like to plant the seed, come back, touch on it a few times. So then months down the road, like when you really get into it, they're, they're, whether it's a team member or whether it's another entity or organization, they're now going to be on board because they've had time to have it like ruminate and like they've maybe done a little bit of research or heard a good thing or two over here. And then they're just more open to that conversation a little bit further down the road than maybe initially. 
I love the idea of the three eyes. I think that's a really great way to visualize it and remember it and probably a good note for us to end on. So Deanne, I think you're going to have the opportunity to make even more Zoom friends with your mm -hmm. uh, neighbors in Syracuse. So huge thanks um, for Chris, Adam, and Gina for uh, spending time with us today and for all of you for uh, joining us as well. So Gina, we get to do this one more time on Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. And what are we going to talk about? What should everyone come back for? Whatever the hell we want to talk about. <laughs> We're going to be all over the charts tomorrow. I want to hear people brag. I want to I want to learn something new that someone's doing with RTO during this challenge period that, that they can share with the others. I mean, we are challenging each other, but sharing information is only for the betterment of the animals. I think we're um, it'll be a creative, fun, open conversation. So please join us. Chris, you better be there. I have like three meetings at the same time, but this is my top priority. <laughs> All right. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you. We super appreciate you and everyone else being here and can't wait to hear back from um, everyone who's participating in the challenge about how it's going for you and have an open conversation and get more ideas uh, this coming Thursday at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. And in the meantime, please go ahead and join us on Maddie's Pet Forum to get your specific questions answered to share more resources that are state specific or county city specific about your legislation. Um, please stay safe everyone and we can't wait to see you on Thursday and then see you in the new future as well. Thank you for all you do for pets and the people and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.